morning, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, you are very much welcome to the 20th webinar of the Castle Thrive series. It is a pleasure once again to have you today. And we will be diving shortly into the discussion uh, for the day. And once again, a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. We'll be having a number of panelists that I will introduce later. But I would like to encourage each and every one of you to uh, get this running on Twitter and invite people by running a Facebook party, uh, watch party, because we have both of those channels running and monitoring what is happening in the discussion today. My name is Bukenya Paul Michael. I will be hosting this webinar today. But before we dive into the webinar, I would like us uh, to begin uh, with a word of prayer. And as I introduce the person praying, for those who want this on Twitter, the hashtags are hash, castle webinar, and the other hashtag is Thrive Public Service. So you can get this running on Twitter and get to host a watch party on Facebook from the Castle Facebook page so that we have your friends and folks joining us in the discussion. But before we dive into anything, as our practice is at Castle, I would like to invite Mr. Bernard Wanyama, a member of the coordinating team, open up this discussion with a word of prayer. Thank you, Paul. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to give you thanks for this day. We thank you for yet another webinar in the Thrive series. We thank you for our panelists, and Lord, we thank you for the sector of public service. We pray that as we deliberate and as we share ideas, that we shall continue to strengthen the sector of public service, and we shall continue to have more achievements and more development coming out of our public service. We thank you for those who work to improve the public service each and every day. We thank you for those with innovative ideas and those who seek to serve their country through the public service. We pray that you will give us a wonderful time, we'll have great deliberation, and that the ideas here will go on to become real things and real changes that will transform this country. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you very much, Bernard. Just a few of uh, laundry items before we begin the main item for today. Uh, we'll be having poll questions once every about 30 minutes. And the questions are addressing the subject at hand. So when you see the question pop up, kindly participate in the poll questions and uh, we'll need to get your view because it helps and aids the discussions that are going on. Again, just to remind you once again, if you're just joined in, for those that follow on Twitter and those that retweet <laughs> the discussions today, the hashtags are Castle Webinar and the second hashtag is Thrive Public Service. So please retweet, uh, pick up the discussions on Twitter, uh, issue your own tweets so that we get the discussion and conversation on the public service in Uganda going. And then the, for you that are attending this webinar, we do have a Q and A chat room. If you look somewhere, typically at the bottom of most of the devices that you are using, in some cases, it may be somewhere on the side and in a few cases on the top where the sub menus are you will see a Q and A chat room. We encourage you to put your questions, to make your comments known, and the panelists we have here today will be able to respond and participate in the discussion there in the Q and A chat room. Now concerning the discussion today, transformation of the public service sector is critical to any national development drive. Singapore had to take drastic measures on the public service in order to begin their journey of national transformation. 
And these measures, these measures uh, spanned from the hiring choices and parameters they used. They went through to the training that they issued with no compromise, as well as the remuneration that they uh, deployed in paying their public servants. They generally, in their day and age, rewrote the script of what people thought the public service was. They operated outside the box. And today we see a Singapore that's leading in development and which has one of the highest GDPs globally. This was never always the case uh, because in the past, Singapore was similar to most third world countries, but they still continue to date to do transformation drives of their public service. Usually at the center of such initiatives, there is often change in policy direction by government, focusing on tightening of interagency coordination, intensive citizen engagement, customized policy communications, and many things that go in that docket of things. The ultimate goal of the efforts being to gain the trust of the citizens and to remain relevant in the current operating environments. Clearly, being static or remaining static or playing catch up will not cut it. In Africa, Botswana and Rwanda have taken various measures as well in terms of managing performance contracts and the enforcing of performance initiatives. According to McKinsey research, in their conversations with public sector leaders across the world, they hear real urgency and a fair amount of anxiety about the need to transform government services at the national, state, city, and municipality levels. And the governments always know that they must find new ways to meet the expectations of citizens, many of whom are increasingly discontented. And as well, the governments also must provide more for less in the current day and age. The discussion therefore today will be focused on how we can propose to improve the public service in Uganda in both effectiveness and efficiency, as well as address the many other delivery challenges faced by the men and women working in this public service to help improve the sector. Once again, you're welcome to today's Castle Think Tank webinar focused on the public service in Uganda. But in the panelists that we have today, in no order of specific importance, we do have Mrs. Sharif Abuzeki, we do have Ms. Gertrude Rose Gamwera, we do have Dr. Diana Atwini, and as well, we have been graced by Chief Guest, the Honorable Justice Ralph Ochan. And as I introduce each and every one of them before they come up to speak, I will give you the full profiles of these esteemed Ugandans um, before each one of them delivers on their discussion. But just before we dive into that discussion, allow me to invite the chairman of the board of directors, Castle Think Tank, Dr. James Magara, to make some opening remarks. And then we shall dive into the discussion today. Welcome. Thank you very much, Paul. And a very, very good morning to you all. And a special welcome to another morning where we are uh, talking about our country and talking about opportunities and uh, things that we can do to make this a better country to live in. Uh, last year, we launched the Castle Think Tank. It was built on a 10 year training program with the Institute of Financial Transformation. So the alumni of uh, the think tank uh, feed into, or rather of the training program feed into the think tank. And uh, we had a meeting in it with, uh, focusing on education, education and African futures. It's interesting that a number of things that were prescribed in that meeting, within a few months, the pandemic has forced us to move in that direction, the direction of the future. Um, this year, we're planning to focus on just one sector, but we realized that when the pandemic struck, there was a huge opportunity that opened up, which we had not really foreseen. It took us a while to see it. Uh, we initially set ourselves to support one of our members uh, who uh, you know, was involved in the lead work in uh, containing the pandemic. 
And then we had we held a, works, a multi sector workshop in, in January and rather in April, on the 25th of April. And uh, it lasts about six hours, so about 160 people present. It was divided into different workshops. And the major focus of that uh, meeting was this is a tragedy that has struck the world, but every tragedy has a good side to it. So, what is the silver lining in this dark cloud? So we asked the participants to focus on the opportunities and not to focus on the, the negative things. What resulted were a series of ideas, a number of ideas that were discussed by the multi sector teams. Uh, preliminary documents were produced and we thought the next best thing to do would be to engage the public with these ideas uh, in, the, in, in the midst of experts and policymakers. And uh, the pandemic also opened up another huge opportunity. Normally, if we were to do this sort of thing like we did last year, it would have cost us a lot of money, um, gathering people, hiring holes, and so on. Realize now we had an online platform. So we've been having these engagements. This is, as uh, Paula said, number 20. Uh, what we do is what we're going to experience this morning, in case you haven't been into any of them before. We're going to present our thoughts um, with some background and then ask the experts to critique them and um, indicate what is okay, what is very wrong and what could work better. We are gathering all this information. There are rapporteurs present who are picking up this information and uh, documents who are coming out, they're beginning to come out. And uh, also what we expect to see a lot more beyond this time are policy briefs that are going to churn out and span into next year. So thank you very much for joining us this morning. I always say this is the time to, um, to, to get your brains opened up. And we are very, very privileged to have a very high caliber panel that uh, will give us the expertise, they'll educate us, uh, they'll help us think even deeper. And so we're really looking forward. Uh, open up your minds, enjoy the morning. And uh, participants, great to have you. Uh, you. Please do get engaged through the Q&A. Uh, you, your thoughts will be picked up. And those who are joining on Facebook as well, um, you're welcome. Thank you very much and back to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Dr. Magara. And indeed, it's such a privilege to have everyone here today. To kick us off in the discussion today, we will be welcoming the discussant from the Castle Think Tank, Mrs. Eva Masiko, to present the think piece on the public service in Uganda. Eva is the chief of party, governance, accountability, participation, and performance program, EGAP. She is a lawyer by training and currently she is chief of party of EGAP, a program which is referred to uh, above. She was also chief of party for USAID's and DFID funded seven year governance accountability participation and performance program GAP in Uganda that focused on strengthening governance and accountability systems in local governments. Previously, Eva served as the chief of party of USAID four year strengthening democratic linkages in Uganda from 2007 to 2011 and was deputy chief of party for USAID's legislative support activity in Uganda, 2002 to 2005, working within the parliament of Uganda to strengthen parliamentary committees. Eva has 20 years of program design, implementation and management experience on local government and accountability systems, parliamentary strengthening, leadership development and civic education. She has worked on a variety of issues, including women's participation in election processes, women and children's land and property rights, and capacity building for civil society organizations. She served as a parliamentary program advisor to the Parliament of Uganda between 2006 to 2007. She also served as a deputy program manager for the Partners for Democracy and Governance Election Support Program that oversaw the Uganda 2006 general election processes. Eva holds a Bachelor of Laws degree from Kerry University and a Master's in Organizational Leadership and Management from Uganda Christian University Mukono. Eva is married to James Masiko and is a mother to four sons. Eva, please take it away and let's hear the data that you have to discuss. Um, thank you, Paul. Um... 
Thank you for that introduction. Uh, good morning or good evening, wherever you're calling in from or you're viewing this webinar from. It's a pleasure for me to present on behalf of the CASO team our thoughts around the public service. And uh, to begin with, as, as Dr. Magara has mentioned and our, our host has mentioned, the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown procedures that followed led to a disruption of service delivery, resulting in impacts on the economy, on public health and livelihoods. We all had to do rapid adjustments, uh, which included reduction of physical presence in public institutions, work largely moved from office to home using various online platforms, revenues for government agencies and local governments significantly dropped, and gaps were exposed in many sectors. Whereas adjustment to remote methods of working is not new, the experience in implementation was varied across ministries and local governments. And as, as has been mentioned earlier, COVID-19 pandemic provides us an opportunity to review our operational practices and nurture a more efficient and integrated uh, public service. So in general terms, the public service is the engine for effective implementation of services and other public goods. It's therefore essential that their personnel is effectively selected, oriented, placed, managed, remunerated, and retired so that it, they can meet the needs for the existing time and the needs for a future. However, this by itself is not sufficient. And the NDP3 states it uh, adequately that improving public sector performance requires three things. The first is the people, which are the civil servants, their leaders and the citizens. The next is the public sector architecture and infrastructure. And then the, 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 the third is the resources that are required. So to move to the background, what is the main function of the public service? Public services are what make the state visible to its citizens. They are the citizens' direct line to government. They make the state tangible through their interaction, direct and indirect. Public services in this way contribute to the relationship between state and citizen. They also contribute to the integration of the whole country, to the peripheries, those, those areas that, those districts or communities that are further away from the center, because there's a public service that runs at uniform uh, regulations, they are also brought in to what's happening in the country. So they contribute to integration. It helps, public service also helps, it's the establishment of control, presence, and authority in all areas. It helps with standardization. Standardization contributes to the creation of a common culture through similar and readily identified public services across the country. So an example is when we have a national ID, it doesn't matter whether you're in Koboko or you're in Karangara, that standardization is the same. And so we are all part of that same system. If there is an integrated curricula for schools, it doesn't matter whether you are in Bukedi or you are in Tungamo, that integrated curricula should apply to everyone. And so it allows for standardization. It also public service has been used uh, as a tool where there's conflict and pacification is needed. That tool has been used to, to be through the public service to win over uh, regions or so areas where there's satisfaction. So the public service is not neutral or independent. It also can be used as a tool uh, for certain action. So coming down to Uganda, what's our current status? So as of December 2019, we had 320,073 employees on the active government payroll. That's a, a huge number, I think. And if you can see from the table, um, our largest um, group is the teaching service, which is about 169,000 people, which is 53%. So the largest cohort, so to speak, is the teaching service, followed by um, the Uganda police force, which is at 13%, 41,000 of them, followed by the health service, which is 12% um, of 38,000. And Dr. Diana, who will be joining us, um, uh, that's her general sector, followed by um, 
district and municipality headquarters, which is 10%. And then at the central government ministry staff is about 4%, uh, prison service 3%, public universities 2%, uh, regional referral hospitals 2%, and go other government agencies 1%. So that's the distribution. Now this group, this team is a key driver as to whether we will harness the gains of the future. This is our engine to the future. This is this is this how they are, how the people, how the infrastructure, and how the resources work around this team of people is our engine to the future. It will determine what kind of Uganda we live in, what kind of our Uganda our children live in, and our grandchildren live in. So they are, they, they, they are key and pivotal to what goes on. So the challenges in the public service are well documented in NDP3. And I'll just um, you know, highlight some, but they are all well documented that those issues are, 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 have been documented severally. Um, one, poor accountability systems and undue focus on process rather than result. I think in our effort to balance accountability, we have become very process oriented and that those processes even trip us from doing what we need to do. Inefficient government systems and processes which, which affect responsiveness and how quickly government can respond, government agencies can respond. We have duplication of mandates uh, again, well documented, uh, some institutions have overlapping mandates with others. Inadequate talent management. We have very brilliant people in our public service, but we, we lose them to the private sector. We lose them to other countries. How do we manage our talent well so that they stay and help Uganda? Uh, inefficient and adequately funded decentralized system of government. I'll speak more about that later limited computerization, um, high levels of corruption. I think you see that documented uh, both formally and informally and ineffective and adequate communication and feedback mechanism. Now, th this last one I added or we added, it was not mentioned under clause 447, but I think it's a key driver as well. It's the poor re remuneration for some civil service cadres. We, we need to think about how do we pay people? How do we retain them? How do we motivate them? They have as many aspirations as those outside uh, the civil service have. And so how do we make our civil service attractive for everyone? Okay, so moving on. Um, again, um, these are the challenges, but the, it, the, there's recognition that there's also been progress. For example, uh, um, some standards, service delivery standards have been set by some sectors like health, education, environment. Uh, there's been an effort to look at the system and the impression of results. So there's been an effort to look at the systems and the structures and the architecture. A report was produced in 2018, but that is yet to be acted on. So there've been, there've been some inroads, some efforts to change. Um, I think what our food for thought is, there's been also um, strides to taking services nearer to people through decentralization that was ushered in in 1993 uh, through the decentralization policy. Um, but even though that happened, the share of budget executed at local governments is this small. The number of, lo of local governments in line with the decentralization policy is, is rising. Yet the share of budget going to local governments is declining. Uh, so over time, we've seen this greater and greater um, retention of funds at the center. And two key studies have been produced by Accord in this, this direction, showing how funds that we should be expending at the local government level are being expended at central government level. And that inhibits their ability. It's like you're running a race, but you have a weight on your leg. So it inhibits the ability to run as fast as they could run. So budget allocations for local governments are mainly for paying workers' salaries. However, these workers are at large sent redundant due to inadequate corresponding operational budgets. So this leads to redundancy, poor quality of service, and at, at especially the sub-national level. 
So this was the context of our public service uh, as, as, as we went into COVID-19. But as we started the, the webinar, we said COVID-19 also uh, showed us our gaps, but also showed us our opportunities and things we can do. So very quickly, um, some of the gaps that were exposed. Um, generally, departments and agencies were ill-prepared for working from home. And otherwise, uh, those methods of work were untested and unproven in many, many government agencies. Uh, many of our processes are paper-based, and they could even face legal challenge if undertaken virtually. The bureaucracy imposed by the public procurement and disposal assets laws, for example, affected the efficiency of many government procurements, where, which were put on hold, especially in the first three months of the pandemic. These requirements that the contract committee has to sit physically, the requirement that a procurement committee has to sit physically, those things we need to rethink going forward. How can we re-engineer ourselves so that we are efficient? Again, using the image of a runner, of a racer, how do we take the weights off our public service so that it can run in this, um, in this period and can be efficient and can, be, can harness the whole potential that Uganda has and the quality of life for all Ugandans. How do we take the weights off the system so that the system can run? So the public service ministry is to be commended because they issued several circulars to respond to COVID-19 to guide, for example, there was circular number three on preventive measures. There was circular number four on management of the public service during the quarantine period. There was circular number six on guide, guidelines for working remotely. So the, we recommend the public service for putting this in place. The challenge, however, was implementation of these guidelines. The reality of space requirements, if you I know many people on this webinar have been in a, in a local government office, have been in some of the ministry offices, the, the, the challenge of space in, in and of itself is an issue. So the issues of social distancing, uh, many of them could not happen. Remote working was significantly affected by technological competences of staff, availability of equipment, internet connectivity. Local governments are heavy, third, uh, number four, are heavily dependent on central government for financing, for responding, for messaging, and as a result, extension of service delivery was seriously impacted. I think some of you may recall uh, the presidential directive that MPs should uh, get the money that they had received to support their constituencies of COVID-19 to be sent to local governments so that local governments can use it within the district. Now that happened, in a, the directive passed in about May, and, but, and, and we saw on, on television many members of parliament sending in, they, bringing in their money, handing it over to local government. Now that's what we saw up front. But behind the scenes, the local governments couldn't spend this money many of them up to last month, September and August, and even some currently, uh, at least had not received approval, the, the formal legal approval to spend that money. So the public sees these people walking in with money, but the local government can't, can't spend because there's some rules and regulations they have to follow. Now saying this does not mean that uh, processes are not good, control measures are good, but they need to be efficient, they need to be responsive, they need to, for the time, they need to run. If that happened in May, and as of September, people can't spend, that is a problem. The largest majority of the workforce uh, uh, of the public service had not been exposed to working at home. And uh, these, these restrictions also affect how they can work flexibly. So there was a steep learning curve for many people as they went into this area. And of course, travel was a challenge for many government essential workers. Was, and, and this ended up, they ended up struggling to execute their duties. But in spite of those challenges, there were also opportunities and things we saw, I already mentioned the public service circulars that allowed for, formally now allowed officially, you could officially work from home. And, uh, and this is a door that is opening that we need to harness. One of the things that has been mentioned is meetings and how much time we, we the public service does spend in the cost of travel, the cost of time, and the cost of venue. Now it's easier. Of course, they, will st they still need for physical meeting and interaction, but the door has been opened and it's an opportunity. And we need to run, not just walk through that door, we need to run. 
uh, the daily public address practice was effective in providing key messaging that helped to align the country to one goal, this initiative of informing the public on what's going on is important and should continue. Uh, it, it, it is important uh, in providing uh, direction and it should, we should encourage it to continue. We should ensure, or, of course, there's the duty that the agencies ha have to be ready to say something that's, that, that is timely, that is accurate to the public, but the practice was a very good one and is a continuing good one. There was a greater attempt at cross-sectoral working that can actually be built upon for other national programs and initiatives. We saw the UPDF working with the Ministry of Health to provide health services. We saw the police working with local governments to, to look up to, 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 to secure borders. So we saw a lot of cross-sectoral work. And that cross-sectoral working is the way to go. NDP3 indicates that the, that the failure for cross-sectoral working was a major shortfall under NDP1 and NDP2. So in NDP3, there is a major shift towards planning cross-sectorally and implementing cross-sectorally. So this, this, this idea of silos and territorialism and you know, entities and budget control, we need help to work cross-sectorally. And we saw a lot of that during the, the, the pandemic, and we are saying it is kudos to government and let it continue. Um, COVID-19 caused lots of information to be available on social media, and that is something to be harnessed. People who were not tech savvy at the time, you know, had to rely on social media, and, and now social media is a major tool for information. How can we harness that? Our public voluntary contributions to government programs was great. Our laws provide for community contribution for services, and it is existing in the law, but we saw such an outpouring of public contribution, and this should continue. Our laws provide for school management committees, health unit management committees. They provide for voluntary contribution to road infrastructure. How do we harness this spirit that was demonstrated going forward of partnership with the public service? Of course, accountability is key for these funds that were provided, because then people were wonder whether it was spent for what hoped it would be spent for. So that ongoing dialogue should continue. Our provision of accountability should continue so that communities and the public can, can yoke together with government to, put, to take the country forward. There was increased think tank uh, activities, people thinking about uh, generating, providing not just their physical uh, contributions, their financial contributions, but even their mental, their skills to solving problems. And, and partnerships, opportunity for Uganda to modernize a lot of our laws to allow for nimble, relevant, and swift engagement on issues uh, in this world. You know, we've had COVID-19 now, but we don't know what will come next. Something else might come next. There's climate change, which is causing a lot of fires in many areas. We had locusts before. We'll have floods. They actually are ongoing floods as we speak. So how, how can we have a government that is nimble, that is able to respond when it needs to? Respond. Government partnerships with private sector increased. MTN and National Water and Sewerage Corporation, for example, identified a number of water points in and around Kampala for people to keep hand washing hygiene. So this partnership, we, 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 there is a lot that is wrong that is not yet there in the public service, but there is a lot of good that we also see. So how do we harness the good and how do we move forward both as the public service itself, but as the community and the people in Uganda, supporting government to do what it is supposed to do. So NDP already, there have been many recommendations uh, for, 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 for reform of the public service. And quickly, I will just um, highlight them and, 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 and say, yes, this is the way to go and, and highlight those which we think are critical for now, but also highlight later the ones that we can quickly take harness because of COVID-19. Pillar one was around transparency and accountability. Some of the things, these have already been recommended. So there's agreement that this is the way to go. This is NDP3. Administer and enforce performance contracts for political leaders, for ministers, for district chairmen. Let's have performance contracts. It's not enough that people elect you. Let's have a performance contract. 
administer and enforce performance contracts for the public service in general. There's already performance contracts for some, but let's do it for everyone. Let's adopt a, an appointment on contractual basis rather on per, per, permanent and pensionable. Once I have my letter, there is no way you can get rid of me. No, let's not do that. This has been approved as a reform and let it happen. Let's enact and implement a law of recovery of corruption proceeds and disposal of, of recovered assets. In, in terms of, let it be risky for you. Let it be risky for you to have wealth that we can't, we can't know where it came from. Let it be an embarrassment that you're showing assets that you do not tie to your salary or to your businesses. Tell us where that wealth came from. And when we get it, let's, 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 implement, let's recover that, those assets and dispose of them and put the money back in the coffers because they initially don't belong to you. Um, so there's been a recommendation and approval of streamlining government structures. And one key one is that let's align, let's go nimble, let's reduce the structure so that we reduce how much we spend across the structures. But some of those structures were set up because there was a problem. Let's deal with the problem and then realign and then run. We shall run and be more efficient if we do that. But when we spread out, we spread the little resources we have and then we are ineffective. Three, strengthen strategic human resource management function at government for improved services. I just want to highlight two under there design and improve, implement a rewards and sanction system. Can we do bonuses, for example? When people are stars, can we recognize them and, and, and do bonuses and do things that really uh, acknowledge their contributions, their innovation? But can we also sanction? We, 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 we have rules for sanctioning actually, but it is very hard to sanction. The law on sanctioning, hard. And our culture also does not sanction very well. But if we, we are to be again using the, the image of a runner, we have to discipline our body, we have to discipline our civil service so it can run. If we don't discipline it, it can't run. Um, we need to introduce exit policy for non-performance. Can people be taken out of the service, please? We need to introduce exit policy for non-performance and then empower MDAs to customize talent management. The agencies need, the, the, our, structure, our structure has some positions that are, for example, um, legal advice. The fact that legal advice is housed in one entity, the Solicitor General, uh, the Ministry of Justice. Now, some entities do have legal advice, but not all. But legal advice is key for decision-making. Many entities are sued because they just don't have the right legal advice timely. Can we realign our structure so that those things take in place? And then depend decentralization and citizens participation. Now, um, Eva, you have about five minutes to go to the end. Sure, I'm wrapping up now. So in terms of recommendations, we already have a lot that is written that if we did, we would be in a different place in five years from today. If we just did that it would be five years for today. But COVID-19 also has shown us that there are major things that we can do, that we can harness. For example, I've talked about implementation of those recommendations is one of them. The other one, can we go online for many things that we are now not doing online? Can we do that? Can we develop the skills that everyone is able to work remotely if needed? Of course, there are some job um, cadres like health, health workers mentioned above. That, but for example, why should universities stop because there is COVID-19? You know, why, why, should some, why should that happen? Let's go online if we can. Oh, uh, let's see what, how we build our infrastructure there. I think COVID-19 shook us, but we can take advantage of that and move forward. Um, we have a challenge with absenteeism already as things stand. So without a rewards and sanctions uh, system that works, remote working will be even harder. It will be even more difficult. So for us, we need to strongly operationalize a performance culture that enables us to be sure that if X is working from home, for example, remotely, that actually that work is happening. And we can do that and we can go lean. So it is key to re-architect, automize, and digitize process flows and systems 
there are government agencies that have registered more success on this front. What can we learn from them? They are in Uganda, they are led by Ugandans. What can we learn from them? What are the lessons learned? And how can we scale this up? This might not happen all at once, but it can be done. And we have to have the minds that it can be done and it will happen. And even private sector will run ahead to provide the services that we need if we say that this is the way the public service would work. And, 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 and lastly, we need to revise our laws and regulations. Some of them are weights, are weights on our civil service. They are weights, they are frustrations. You know, the law is also used as a tool of development. It can, you can use the law to take you ahead. So instead of allowing our laws to tie us to the past, can we have laws that take us into the future? How do we amend our laws to drive us into the future? And, and therefore there is a, a great responsibility for our agencies to rise above the day-to-day -day operations, our leaders to rise above the day-to-day -day operations, which are important and which exist, then to rise up and look into the future and say, okay, what laws do we need to go there? And therefore, what do we need to do now to enact those laws to go there? Because unless we do that, we will always be responding. We will always be responding to crises, but not sort of leapfrogging into the future. So how do we do that? So in conclusion, in conclusion, if the above interventions are carried out, the benefits would include improved delivery of the public services and all, all, all related aspects within the national development plans. It will lead to resilience of the Ugandan public service to shocks. So if there are other shocks which will come, which we don't know, we'll have a resilient service that can continue to do what it is about to do. We'll have increased utilization of automated workflows, of course, which can allow for greater transparency. They also have risks. It doesn't mean that automation doesn't take away the risks, but it can allow for greater efficiency. It can allow for cost savings, which we desperately need as a country. And then we'll have more effective and efficient government delivery, a further ironing out service delivery. Let's see how we can get there, not why we can't get there. Let's see how we can harness what we have to get there, but not the reasons why we can't. Thank you very much for your attention. Over Thank to you. Thank you very much, Eva. Indeed, uh, it makes one uh, think whether we cannot do this like yesterday, but much appreciated for your presentation. And uh, once again, to remind us that we, this is the Castle webinar, and today we're focusing on the public service. On Twitter, our hashtags are Castle webinar and Thrive Public Service. Those are the hashtags for today. So please tweet and let the people know what's going on. And uh, as well, you can host a Facebook watch party so that we can get uh, others, friends to follow uh, the discussion today. Please uh, engage on the Q&A. I don't as yet see any questions or responses or comments on the Q&A section. If you look at the bottom of your screen, where the submenus are, you will see a section for you to engage in question, commentary. I encourage you to make your question and your comment known in that section. We will be having a poll question uh, every now and then, and the next poll question comes up shortly um, before we bring in the first panelist to comment. And the poll question reads, what has been your experience while interacting with the public service? What has been your experience while interacting with the public service? The first response is I find them so public service pleasant and easy to work with. I find the public service system quite bureaucratic and unclear. I find public servants rude and unpleasant to work with. And lastly, I hardly interact with public servants, so I do not know. What has been your experience while interacting with the public service? Kindly make your point or your vote or your opinion known because towards this discussion, your opinion matters. What has been your experience 
while interacting with the public service. You find the public servants pleasant and easy to work with. The system is quite bureaucratic and unclear. The public servants are rude and unpleasant, or you hardly interact with public servants, so you do not know. We really need to get your view on that. We have about 20 seconds to go on this. I encourage participation so we can get a bit of traction in terms of knowing the pitfalls that can be addressed. We have about 10 seconds to go on the question. Please make your opinion known. Okay. So right about now, I think we can see what is the result. The majority of us think that the system is quite bureaucratic. It's an overwhelming majority of 72%, followed dismally by people who hardly ever interact, so they don't know, and uh, by those that find, oh, actually the next, Sorry about that. 72% find it quite bureaucratic and unclear. 17% find public servants rude and unpleasant to work with. That's an overwhelming 89% that shows the need for us to do something about the public service. Thank you very much for participating in the vote. Now we are moving on to our first panelists in the discussion today. Mrs. Sharifa Buzeki is the Commissioner Public Service Inspection and Quality Assurance, Ministry of Public Service. The current role involves development service delivery of service delivery standards and enforcing compliance to set standards, rules, procedures, and systems in government institutions. Sharifa previously worked as a commissioner, human resource management, heading the Department of Human Resource Policies and Procedures, Ministry of Public Service, Uganda. She formulated, evaluated, and reviewed human resource policies for the Uganda Public Service and provided guidance on the interpretation and implementation of the human resource policies. She holds a master's degree in public administration, a postgrad diploma in human resources management, and a Bachelor of Arts in Social Sciences from the Islamic University in Uganda. She is a chartered human resource policy analyst from the Global Academy of Finance and Management. She is a proud alumnus of Female Future Leadership Program offered by the Federation of Uganda Employers. Sharifa, you are welcome to comment and give your view about this subject that come today. Over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, um, moderator. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Eva for the insights she has managed to give us on the public service. The analysis of the state of the public service and the recommendations made by Eva are a replica of what is embedded in the NDP. And uh, as government or as the public service, we are anchoring all our efforts towards uh, implementing uh, or working with the aspirations under the NDP. Uh, that said, uh, I would like to say that uh, the Minister of Public Service, on behalf of the public service, developed uh, a policy paper on transformation of the public service in 2013. Uh, it was not fully implemented. That's why at the moment we see that the current NDP3 is majorly anchored on the transformation agenda for the public service. Uh, as alluded to by Eva, this agenda has three pillars. Uh, just to put it in the context of the public service, we have the client who is the citizen of Uganda. We have the public servant who is we who are working for the public service. And then the processes, systems, and structures, as she mentioned. So to handle the recommendations which have been uh, made in the NDP and as presented by Eva, 
we have an aspect on human, resource, human capital development, where we want to have quality at entry into the public service. When these public servants enter, how do we maintain them? How do we motivate them to stay longer in the public service? Uh, in the presentation, it came out clearly that the issue of low remuneration has led to the current level of attrition we are seeing in the public service. The government adopted a five-year pay target for the public service. It is being implemented, but the only constraint is that it is being implemented in the first manner because of the resource envelope which we have. So it is paying attention to better remuneration of its workers to be able to stay with them longer, motivate them to work with us longer and deliver the public services. That is an addition to what we are doing uh, under human resource development. We have uh, developed a human resource planning framework. We are currently carrying out uh, a national capacity needs assessment so that we capture the current skills of the public servants and then make recommendations on where we need to improve and where we need even to upscale or review the job requirements to meet the current times. So majorly, all those have been aligned to the strategic objectives which are in the NDP. The other issue is the transformation agenda. The transformation paper aspirations are directly put in the NDP3. And as we speak now, ministries, departments, agencies are aligning all their strategic plans to the NDP3. Minister of Public Service in particular, we are in the final stages of taking our strategic plan into the approval levels so that we have these recommendations which have been here, mentioned here put into uh, the strategic plan and they form a roadmap for our implementation for the next uh, four years because we are already in the first year of implementation. Uh, the, other, the other major recommendation which uh, is really major for government because the services we offer are for the benefit of the citizenry of Uganda. It is strengthening accountability for results. Eva brought it out well about holding the political leaders accountable, the public servant accountable, but we have to go to the other side of the coin. What are we supposed to do for the people we are delivering these services for? Civic competence is very key in this area. We need to empower I want this to be added. We need to empower the citizens of Uganda to demand for services. Even when we put the rewards and sanctions framework, we put the disciplinary uh, processes, procedures, make them unbureaucratic. The person benefiting from the services of the public service needs to tell us how well we are performing and how bad we are performing so that we reshape the way we do our work. So, in that direction, we have uh, prioritized development of service delivery standards. They are there embedded in other laws, regulations. But the question is, the, the Ugandan citizen will not read the 100 laws we have in Uganda to be able to know how we deliver our services. So we have planned to uh, document all these standards, put them in compendiums, disseminate them to the public, so that we empower the citizen to demand for the services we offer. And we feel that when we empower them, the civic competence we are seeing now, because Ugandans have started to question, you go in a hospital, wait for 30 minutes without a health worker coming to you, they'll raise an alarm. You'll sit on social media. So civic competence is there at some level, but we need to up, we need to up the game so that the civil servants are held accountable from either side inside government and outside government. So we need to add that ingredient of the civic competence on the recommendations which have been made so that internally in the public service, we work on the performance management processes, but also the civil society, the Ugandan citizen should be able to hold the public servant accountable uh, for whatever they are, for their omissions, actions and inactions. Uh, coming to the, pandemic. 
Yes, as noted by uh, Eva, there seemed to be effective emergency response uh, on the side of government. But I would like to say, just as you said, we managed to come out clearly and guided the service on how best we can cope within the uh, restrictions which were put uh, to manage the, the pandemic. And uh, I would like to say that as the public service, we had a lot to learn from that, from what happened during the pandemic. For instance, we learned that we can reduce wastage on what we thought was a must have. When you have a meeting in the public service, you have to provide the venue, refreshments, uh, allowances here and there. But now, these are all avoidable. They are avoidable and uh, we have remarkably reduced costs. We have learned that we can even monitor online. We can even uh, carry out online inspections. We can even communicate with the local governments as far as Kabong when you are seated in your office and have what you want to be done or sent, sent to you. So in terms of administrative costs, in terms of managing flexibility, the, the public service did not lock down because 70% of their workforce was at home. What does that mean? We have public services which can be delivered without having physical interaction. And that will have to go into our recruitment processes we have to ask ourselves questions. Do we still need to procure a table, a chair, higher office space if we are hiring a public servant? Can this public servant work from their own uh, sitting rooms? We hire them, retire them without looking at them, but managing their performance. So the priority should be on the level of engagement. And this is what we are planning to by automating all government processes. As we speak now, uh, payments automated, uh, salaries, pension, other financial payments automated. We are going into inspection, electronic document management, and all these, we hope that as we implement the NDP3, uh, we will have to put Uganda to where we desire it to be. Uh, in terms of performance management, this is very key. Even when you provide resources, when you provide uh, people who have the right talent, as long as their performance is not managed, you are not going to get what you want. So as uh, Eva said, we are going into performance contracting. Or yes, we are going into performance contracting so that whoever takes government money, the performance is measured, managed, and it informs your continuity stay in the public service. What we need is to have the support of the populace to ensure that this is actually done. The other issue we learned is the power of communication. Eva alluded to that in how Minister of Health was being able to disseminate information, but also internally, how we were communicating with the public servants to get work done without us being with them physically. So uh, I would like also to say that um, we as the public service had to adopt and public servants have changed their attitude towards online or e-governance or uh, working with the current tools because we were taking a lot of time. Somebody is supposed to attend a meeting, she is in the field and you want these people to come physically. At the moment as we stand, meetings are being managed seamlessly because wherever you are, you don't have an excuse to not attend the meeting. But also in terms of performance management, as we go ahead, the questions we are asking we are so ourselves, in view of remote working, in view of virtual management, do we still have to manage attendance, to, to, to record attendance through physical appearance or through delivery of results? So as we go into implementation of the aspirations under NDP3, change is inevitable. And as the public service, we have accepted that we can no longer do things ordinarily as we used to do. Uh, at the moment, I would like to stop there and uh, hand over to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharifa, indeed, um, for that wonderful 
uh, sharing of where we are at in terms of the activities that public services undertaking to move us forward. We'll have a second discussion, and this is Rose Gertrude Samuera. Rose is the Secretary General of the East Africa Local Governments Association and the Secretary General of the Uganda Local Governments Association in Kampala. As Secretary General, she has been able to steer and make several contributions that profile the associations. In Uganda, some of the notable interventions have included serving and representing the local government association on various working group and sharing committees on decentralization and public service coordination. And uh, as well, she has uh, led the um, done advocacy and has represented local governments in the constitutionally mandated annual sector negotiations that start at the national budget cycle. Rose boasts of over 20 years of working experience in the area of local government and public sector management. In this time, she has served her constituency on several committees and boards of local and regional and international level. The notable assignments Rose has been involved in include being a member EU Policy Forum for Development, EU Development Cooperation, member Pan-African Council, AU representing the local government association and member of East Africa Community SG Forum Regional Dialogue Committee, member of, of East African Local Government Forum for ministers and local government associations, member U MOLG LFI board, member EU UNCDF DNU program, board member, and as well Landnet board member, East African Law Society member, and member of the Uganda Law Society. She is a grad professional graduate lawyer and a graduate of the executive MBA from Esami and Maastricht, Esami Arusha, Tanzania. Rose, you are welcome to make your contribution to the discussion today. Thank you very much, Paul. And a very good morning to everybody who has joined us um, on this uh, webinar. I'm glad to be here. And I'd like to really thank um, Eva and uh, Sharifa for their submissions they've already shared with you concerning uh, the discussion for today. COVID-19, what are the opportunities to thrive? And in particular, we are looking at the public service. So um, I wanted to start off with a few, uh, one key teaser. Um, why, where are these services being delivered? And uh, the reason why I wanted to project this thought into our discussion for the day is we have been provided with a, a statement that public service is the engine, the engine for our better tomorrow. So if it is the engine for our better tomorrow and we take a good look at the table, which showed us where the public servants are, out of the total 320 and 73 servants on the payroll as of December 2019, 11 of these according to my deduction and uh, uh, from what I see in the table, 11,837 are at the center. A quick look at the follow-up can be translated to mean that all those civil servants comfortably perform and deliver their mandates at what we call the local government or subnational level. And that constitutes 96%. That is what I wanted to throw there as I begin uh, the discussion for the day. And um, for me, this speaks a lot to what Eva has been talking about in terms of the, what have been our challenges? Where do we need to go? Sharifa has also had added on, on, on to these issues. Um, much of what happens, like Eva said, is a reflection of central government what we need to do to drive the national agenda 
and who we work with. And um, in this country, of course, at regional level, uh, yes, East Africa as well, where I, um, I'm also serving, we opted for certain governance paradigms, and in particular, decentralization by devolution, and which is why we have the local governments come into play. The 96% explains clearly the, the role of local government institutions. The fact that 96% of the actors in public service are actually active, be it the stations at the local government level, means that local governments become the frontliners for service delivery. And this is a fact which we need to put and center in all our policy planning and program implementation processes. In one of the Q&As just before I spoke, I checked in and I saw a question, why these things have been documented? Why, is it, why isn't change happening? And my, my, my quick um, response to that, which I hope this webinar can reflect on, is because the good reforms that Eva mentions about, which try to advo advocate for change in our public service, seem to be concentrated at the central government level, at the national level. And when it comes to rolling them out, the local government level or the sub-national level clearly becomes like a tag along. We have cooked, now we need to implement. Let's bring the, 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 the other peripheries, which Eva talked about on board, which shouldn't be the case. Because if you have 96 of the people down there, then there is the issue of involvement engagement, cooking the policy reforms with them to make things happen and therefore the change can be integral. It can become visible and easy to execute and implement at the end of the day. So the current con critical considerations and drivers as we discuss the topic today should be how are we positioning these frontliners for local service delivery? And COVID clearly brought this out because when it came to undertaking response, we had to have the COVID response task teams located in the local governments. That is a true attestation that if you to start on anything, that's where to start. That's where the actors are. But also I've added the critical consideration we have in terms of our global development agenda. We've been talking about the sustainable development goals and even during, before COVID, during the course of talking and preparing ourselves for this agenda implementation, it was very clear that local governments are the place to be. So the message here is, if we are going to cause change, we have to reposition our structure and institutional thinking around working together and not preparing for the local governments the change we need to see happen. Um, we, we talked about, um, and we continue to talk about, and we shall be continuing to talk about the NDP3, which was recently um, launched. But Eva and uh, Sharifa have talked and zeroed in on the applications when it comes to public service, human resource development, and transformation. And a quick look from our perspective, we people and the actors working in the local governments, where things actually happen, is that when you look at the program outlay, all the 18 programs, and uh, as aligned uh, to the five objectives, you find that there's, there's been an assignment of roles, lead roles, in terms of leading the, the direction. But a closer look and study, we are continuing to study this, we find that there is that blindness to the fact that, yes, we may have Ministry of Public Service leading human resource development and transformation, but there is this partner, this actor called the local government, because for you to be able to achieve that strategy you're writing, you will need the partner called the local government to make it real. And the NDP doesn't seem to bring out in terms of the strategic implementation direction, doesn't need, doesn't clearly bring out this, this message. And for us, it takes us to the issue we've argued on time and again that we need to remember that there is decentralization if things are to happen. We've got a beautiful policy, but we are not optimizing its benefits. 
we tend to concentrate a lot at the center. We tend to look inward mostly and uh, in, in, in the, uh, at the central level and, and think that things will roll out. And yet the policy framework, the constitutional framework defines our roles differently. Eva mentioned that issue of mixed roles and responsibilities, the conflicts which impede our progression where we need to go. Of course, the resources, I threw the last pointer there, national budget strategy. You have a 9% allocation today going to the local governments for both development and non-development agenda. If 96% of public service outcomes are at local government level or sub-national level, is the 9% adequate to take us where we need to go. So these are some of the reflections we need to have. And um, I'll, I, I came up with some four thematic kind of what I'd call recommendations, which we can continue to discuss. Uh, and they speak to uh, the presentation from Eva and from Sharifa. And uh, I thought that um, from our point of view as local governments, if we are going to see positive changes, transformation in the public service we need today and tomorrow. There must be a building of stronger collaboration and partnerships between the center and the local government. Today, we have a lot of, of, of reference of we and them. We, the ministries, those local governments. It shouldn't be like that because it is one government. It's just a definition and separation of roles and mandates so that each one makes a contribution to throwing into this basket for our national development agenda to be attainable. So we need to be to be seeing stronger collaboration mechanisms. And I hope NDP will be able to, um, the NDP3, to bring this out much more clearly. Uh, there's been a discussion around policy and legal reforms. Beautiful reforms coming up. Some of them seem to be producing results. But where are these results happening? Because at the same time, we, the local governments, have been saying, wonderful, the problem is, as you conduct these reforms, as you carry them out, you're constraining us, you're tying us. The discretion is no longer there for us to act and be able to make our contribution. Because the law that governs local governments calls for disc discretion to act. We forget that we have a local governance agenda where we have different actors, the political actors, and the civil servants for that matter. But we don't stop there. We go down to our territorial um, definition of space where we have the private sectors in there, the citizens. Sharifa has talked about the citizens. So when we are making these reforms at the national level, we need to remember that. We tend to forget that. But understandably so, we began to understand as local governments because the issue of accountability has come out so much to the, to the fore that we've tried to improve processes and systems to make government more accountable to the system. Unfortunately, the moment we do that and we forget to integrate the, the, the rules and the, the rules of the game concerning local governments, we constrain that. And the visibility of government at that level in the periphery is limited. And therefore, we get uh, a bit disturbed. So we need to check that. I'm glad that Sharifa and uh, Eva have equally talked about the policy reforms. I hope that the national um, strategy under NDP3 will adequately address us. Of course, we know and we already see the National Planning Authority has rolled out uh, a study to review the decentralization process and hopefully it can be able to capture the recommendations of the sector actors in there. Funding is a prerequisite for the public service to be able to transform and deliver, borrowing from the lessons of COVID. Um, the national budget allocation for us we've always recommended as local government. At the minimum, worst case scenario, let it be 25%. But the idea would be at least 40% because much of what needs to be done uh, is happening there. I'll keep repeating that. Uh, Eva talked about a lot of money being retained at the center, projectorization leading to bulk of funds being retained at the central government level is not justified. There, there, there's been issues of capacities being raised. At local government level, there are no capacities. But it is also true that when you go down there, the people who are working in local government are our contemporaries, contemporaries of even those serving in the center. 
So it's just what, um, uh, what the fact is, they just don't have the resources to work with. They are made redundant and therefore they look ineffective, unproductive. So we need to make use of them. They are there, we need to make use of them. The numbers may not be enough because we've talked about still the lack of, um, it's not an attractive place to be. You can't go to a local government with all this innovation around in your head and you're constrained by bureaucracies and lack of resources to use. You can't even get a chair to sit on, you know? So these are some of the, of the reflections we need to, to unpack uh, in the NDP3. But apart from the dependence on, on the central government provision, we are now speaking alternative funding options. Local governments are self-governing entities. They should be able to collect tax and raise revenue for the services. Unfortunately, the reforms have tended to constrain that discretion as well. We see that now even local revenues have to be collected and put on to the central account uh, consolidated fund. Then they have to request for them. And the bureaucracy of releases affects the whole entire um, avenue of possible money where they could have had discretion to prioritize investments. So we are beginning to have a discussion around alternative funding. And the quick uh, entry point we are thinking of, uh, or we, which we have, is the sixth pillar of decentralization, which is local economic development. The beauty about this is this also provides possible entry points on how we can behave better as a public service because it brings in all those tenants of, of borrowing from the good lessons of the private sector uh, how to do business issues of contracting i mean you you've got to deliver so performance co contracts then become critical and key because we need to show that there is value for money if we are going to get into joint ventures and actions with the private sector and if we're going to increase revenue, get money from, from, from the people, we have to be accountable. So we need to uh, uh, do a lot of investments around that. Uh, but the public service, the civil servants, should also be prepared to be able to make their contribution in, in making local economic development work. That takes me to the issue of capacity building for development. I've noted the, 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 the entire discussion around having quality uh, civil servants coming in and remaining on board. Our challenge in the local government fraternity, and uh, it speaks also to uh, why we see gaps with the citizenry, is that a lot of investments have tended to concentrate on the technical team, the professionals. We forgot, we've forgotten the political leaders, who we have given the mandate, the whole issue of governance. They are the ones who represent the people, they're the ones who mobilize the people for active involvement and engagement. They're the ones who supervise. They have the oversight mandate to make sure that things are happening right. But we have put very little investment in the political leaders. Once they're inducted, and uh, like the recent experience, we had a five-year term, but they only got inducted towards the end, the last two years. So we had three years where we had political leaders who did not know what they're doing, not to mention the fact that we are not keen attach some form of qualification as we see them into positions of responsibility. So this is a, a, a I hope public service can capture this uh, much more seriously and not and not leave it as a matter of of that is local government. Let Ministry of Local Government plan for them. I hope public service can embrace a wholesome intervention for uh, capacity building continuous, not just one of it, continuous for the political leaders. They handle audit reviews for, for heaven's sake. They do recruitment through the District Service Commission. So it, it, it's, a, it's a, um, a very, very fragile and critical entry point that contributes to the effectiveness of public service at local government level. Of course, capa yeah. capacity... Sorry, no, I was just saying we have about two minutes to go. Okay, and I'm going to wrap it up with a, a big one, which has already been touched on uh, as part of the capacity building, the migration to e to e-governance. Digitalization is a must. Um, Eva mentioned uh, Singapore, Rwanda, and Botswana, and I must attest to the fact that one of the key drivers of change has been use of ICT. We uh, in Uganda worried about our um, heavy local government admin institution and administrative structure. Too many local government units, how do we outreach expensive? Most of the money goes into operational and, uh, and uh, recurrent costs. 
ICT is a good uh, way to go, a must way to go. And the Sharifa has mentioned we have seen it's not possible because um, the, the way the, the work of local government evolves is that it involves mobilization of the people. So to improve communication, to improve outreach, we have ICT. So we must be turning to prioritize investments around building stronger and better ICT infrastructure and make it accessible even to the most rural of local government. Because right now they, they, they struggle with that. Um, um, unstable network. Even the equipment they use is a bit outdated. So we need to be able to tool them right so that they are, they, are, they are positioned to be able to change and give us what we need. So let's invest in the corporateness of local government because even the law allows for that. The corporateness, business-minded, business approach. We do mindset change for our civil service. We shall get there. They'll be able to get on board and we get to see that our public service um, feeds in and taps into the potentials that the COVID experiences has brought to us. So that's uh, what I can have for now. I could talk uh, for ages. I'm happy to have been able to share that with you. Thank you so much, Gertrude Rose. Indeed, you've mentioned a number of things, corporateness of local government. I'm itching to see that come to life in Uganda. And also the disconnect between uh, central government and uh, local government. But mine is to moderate for now. Um, and we will be moving soon into another panelist. But thank you so much for um, the presentation. I will be calling for another poll question just about now before we move into the third panelist for today. The question goes, what should government do to streamline and improve public service? What should government do to streamline and improve public service? One, improve coordination and complementary policy approaches. Eliminate corruption. Three, capacity development. Four, eliminate bureaucratic legal framework, which is over-reliant on the central government leading to sluggishness. What should government do to streamline and improve public service? One, improve coordination and complementary policy approaches. Two, eliminate corruption. Three, capacity development. And four, eliminate bureaucratic legal framework, which is over-reliant on central government leading to sluggishness. Please make your opinion known. It is important for us as we continue the discussion on the public service in Uganda. And as Ugandans, we need to pretty much catch up and possibly overtake the rest of the world. Uh, it is possible. Um, other countries have done it before. No reason why Ugandans can't do it. So make your opinion known on this question. Um, I'm watching clearly the numbers of participation. I would like to see the percentage go up. We have about 20 seconds to go before the poll question is brought to a close. What should government do to streamline and improve public service? Coordination and complementary policy approaches, eliminate corruption, capacity development, or eliminate bureaucratic legal frameworks. What should government do? In about five seconds, we'll be closing this particular poll. Hope you have made your view known. And thank you very much for participation. It is interesting that it is overwhelming. There is a need for us to eliminate corruption. And uh, the next closely followed by removing bureaucratic legal frameworks. And lastly, improving coordination and complementary policy approaches. But what is interesting, no one has touched on capacity development. Not sure if that is just a factor of what is teaching people most at this particular point. But that is the opinions that have been given on this particular uh, poll question. We do have our third panelist ready to come on board. And I will make that introduction right away. Dr. Dana Kanzira Atwini is um, a full medical doctor. I'm not sure how you introduced this MBCHB and master ED 
is a permanent secretary in the Ministry of Health of the Republic of Uganda. She is charged with technical leadership as well as stewardship of all financial resources at the ministry. Dr. Diana is currently focused on introducing reforms in culture, ethics, and values in the sector, which she believes will increase quality and access to health care. This is through her advocacy for value for money, proper resource optimization, and accountability. Dr. Diana is a staunch crusader against corruption in the health sector. She is a physician specialist in internal medicine with a postgraduate in project planning and management. She has rich experience in international clinical trials and bioethics, especially in the area of HIV AIDS. Dr. Atwine is the former director of the Health Monitoring Unit under the State House of the Republic of Uganda, whose role is to ensure a responsive and accountable national healthcare system through access to care. The unit is also aggressive in fighting corruption in the sector and holding accountable those that are found breaching the established code of conduct. She is a strong advocate for integrity, transparency, and results-oriented performance. Dr. Diana is passionate about the quality of care and upholding the dignity of Dr. Pina, it's a pleasure to have you today on the discussion. So take it away and share your views on the discussion at hand today. Over to you, Dr. Twine. Um, First of all, I want to thank CASO for organizing this uh, webinar discussion on the issues and reforms that can bring about the performance uh, that can bring about transparency, that can bring about, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm on the farm. You'll see the background is just the bush, but uh, I just felt I really needed to attend this this, uh, this webinar. And um, it, it is very, very critical at this time when we are talking about um, uh, uh, reforms with, with a view of what is existing right now uh, with COVID. And, and, and therefore we need really to, to focus on how we can perform better, but also uh, with, with the challenges that, that we're facing at the moment. I want to thank, if I want to thank Sharifa and the last presenter, I just kept on getting off on and off because I was walking. Um, so I, I just want to say, that what Eva presented, it really touches the core issues that, that, that affect performance of, um, of, 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 of public service. I will just concentrate on only three um, because of time. The first one is mindset change. Everything begins with what we believe in, what we can do. And, and also the mindset of, of our, our worker. I have had the notion where people say, ah, oh, no, don't worry. If you join government, that will be it. You know, there's you know, sec job security. And, but they, they don't talk about the other responsibilities of results that, that must be presented, the, the results that must be shown. No, they, they just say there's job security. And, and so someone comes in public service knowing as long as you get your, your, your letter, as long as you get appointed, and as long as it shows that it is permanent and pensionable, that's it, you know? Um, even if you perform, if you don't perform, it's okay. First of all, you are sure the even of promotion, as long as you fill the other forms and go and sit for interviews and all that, and all that, and, and no one, no, okay, I, 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 for, for me, I have seen it in, in Ministry of Health. You get commissioners that have been there for 30 years and all they is just promoting, promoting. And even when you write clearly that this person is a non-performer, clearly non-performer is corrupt, is what, then they say, oh, you know, you need to provide evidence, but I cannot provide evidence. I am the supervisor. I am seeing this person who is all the time away from office, who does not fulfill even the output 
the, 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 the budget cycle starts and you say everyone must come up with the strategic objectives, strategic deliverables. And, and at the end of the year, you ask and the deliverables are not there, but those are people you will go there and do the, the, the they do interviews and they, they pass, they just pass and they automatically promoted. And so the issue of, first of all, when I go back to mindset, mindset change. First of all, we, we want to inculcate a culture of work, 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 so that even when I am away, I am here on the farm, I am walking, but I knew that really this, this is something that I needed to attend. So I make an effort. I have, I've been moving all over to look for a place where I can stand and get internet. But, 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 but the issue of, 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 of performance to say that even if I am not in office, this delivery must be achieved. Even if I am far away, I don't have to only come when we have the right mindset to work. Some people come and read papers, put quotes on the, what have you delivered? Can you tell me what you have delivered? And all, all they know is job security. First of all, how do we, all the entrants, all the new entrants, but even not only the new entrants, Am I on? Hello? Yes, Dr. Benna, you're on. Okay. We've been okay. struggling a so, bit so, with your... So, so I, was, I was asking, I was asking about the, 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 the mindset. How do we deal with the mindset of the workforce? The mindset of a workforce, first of all, orientation. And this orientation doesn't have to have a workshop in the Jinja Public Service Institute. No, this, this mindset must be inculcated in our institutions. A, a worker, a doctor, you are an intern, but half of the time you are on, 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 on WhatsApp. I keep on asking doctors on these forums. I said, you guys, when do you work? I see you do full time on work, WhatsApp. How do you work on WhatsApping all the time? How do you multitask? Because really clinical care, you must pay attention to the patient. You must be there for the patient. How do you WhatsApp the whole day? That, that is something that we must deal with on the, on the orientation, 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 orientation. And orientation, it, it, it has to, we have to think through. I don't even have an answer to tell you the truth because I have tried, I have tried, ask Eva. We have been working on this together. And we, we get retreats, we talk, we talk, we, mindset, you know, renew of the of commitment. How can we commit ourselves? How can we how can we really look at performance? How can we how can we get saved, Banang? How can we get saved and go back to real, real performance? And you, how do we cause that? Because it is that culture of mindset change that came in and really transformed the whole workforce. The leadership, the structure of leadership, the structure of, 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 of sanctions, we could send people on suspension and they've taken me to court. You can imagine someone steals government resources. And, and, and you suspend and you start institu uh, instituting uh, uh, investigations, then they take you to court. Then they hold that you, 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 have, no, you, you have no right to, to investigate this person. So now all those things, the, the, it is a web. It is a web of things that we must cut, 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 cut. Slowly, we reduce this big mountain until we finish this mountain of the mountain of sound. and rewarding where are people just quote the, 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 the public service uh, uh, standing orders but now they have outlived the, the, their purpose we cannot continue working the way we, we worked in in the, in the in the in the 80s or in 90s the things have changed 
if you don't deliver, get off. We, we hire other people. We, have not, we are not short of workers. We get off, get off. Either be demoted. If you are a commissioner, be demoted. Go, 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 go back to principal something. And, 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 and we get another person to work. And if you, because that's how public service, I mean, that's how, that's how private sector works. And that's how you see results being delivered. Because if you come and you are hired and you do not perform, then, then in the, 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 the next thing, they don't renew your contract. They don't renew your contract and you go and you look for another job. And then maybe you learn from there and then that next job, you take it serious. But here, where people do not deliver and all we see is just continuous promotion. Then also the structure. Our structure has been overrun by time. Our structures do not meet the needs of the changing times. I have, now I have, I have a struggle right now, right now in the sector of health. Um, for me, I'm giving examples because I, 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 I normally like sharing my examples because they speak volumes. I am not theorizing. I'm telling exactly what is happening. I want to digitalize, digitalize all regional referral hospitals, and then we scroll, go down up to the lower health units, so that then we cut down on absenteeism. Because when you digitalize, if I have seen patients, I'll be able to, even in, in my office, I'll be able to go on my computer and know Dr. Diana has, has seen so many patients. I am able to tell that patients came and waited for hours without being seen, but no one wants to implement that. I am going in circles and in circles. And what do they say? Oh, you know, we don't have any structure to support ICT services at the, at, at, at the, at the, at the regional referral, at the district hospital. Oh, we don't have all this. We don't have staff. We don't have ICT. ICT people to support us. So what, what do I do? Then I keep on coming back and say, please, can we get maybe contract to, can we hire some people? ICT, help me. Please. ICT, can you second some people? You know, that is not enough. We need to restructure everything to make things is, for example, our bureaucracy, 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 my goodness, bureaucracy, bureaucracy, something small, something that would take just one day to make a decision. Then say, now, of course, bureaucracy it is good. It is good to, to remain within the framework of government because also if you open up too much, you get errors and then you make, you pick or take advantage. And therefore we need regulations, we need laws, we need what? But I, and I am glad Justice Ochan is on this forum. I have lost government resources through courts of laws, fake courts of laws. People don't go to court because maybe they're overwhelmed. I just want a legal officer. Just in my structure, I have a legal officer. And I have failed. I have failed to hire. Every day I lose cases because no one follows up because no one follows up all these cases in court and they come up with all these botched cases on government because they know that government can lose money and, and then you take advantage and people go behind and, and connive and, 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 and rip government of money that we could have stopped. Just to hire a legal officer, it has taken me three years begging begging just to hire a legal officer to follow up to make sure that the files, you know, they are reviewed, that the, 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 the applications are made in time. If there is a appeal, it is done. They work with the Solicitor General. Even when Solicitor General approved that, please go ahead and hire, I have failed. Why? Bureaucracy. And really without looking at a bigger picture of what we can get as government. But bureaucracy, we tend to put bureaucracy before efficiency. We tend to put laws and legalistic things before efficiency and accountability and value for money. I have issues, for example, in procurement. I get problems. I'm asking my people, but surely how could we have bought something like this at a higher cost? Oh, you see, madam, you know, they say, madam, my God, madam, that word. Oh, you see, madam, 
it is because this was the, the best bidder, you know, it was the best evaluated bidder. So that's just here when I sent someone in town just to do market survey, they told me this. Oh, how could you come up? Oh, you see, you know, if we change, you know, we'll be uh, administrative reviews, money, they will go to court, what, 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 what. And then you end up allowing bureaucracy before value for money. Uh -uh, because the law, the law says this, therefore we cannot. So now all that, eh? well, that that's why, that's how you hear, you hear corruption. Because that kind of legalistic, whatever, tendency, puts actually corruption at, at Kumwanjo, 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 there on that high table. Corruption, you find a big giant of corruption seated on the high table because all sugar-coated in the laws and bureaucracies. So for me, really, if we want to change our public service and it delivers results like in the private sector, and you need to look at all those countries you are, you are, you are quoting, Singapore, Rwanda here, this country that has nothing. Why? Because you do something, you are fired. Immediately, you are fired. You are fired and that's it. You are fired, therefore, when you come to work, you know that it is work and it is work and it is work. Nothing else and it is results. You don't deliver, then you, you, you have to find your level before even they, they stack you. So I, I think that that is the notion that is, that is something that we need to infuse. If it is, if it is a therapeutic infusion, we need to put everyone on, on the bed and we infuse. Infuse performance, infuse results, infuse change of mindset, infuse getting away with, with you know, short, these legalistic things. It doesn't mean it exists very well, and we deliver results very well. But somehow we put all these things in between. Then standing orders need to be revised. We have talked about this. Yes, I know that we have worked with, with, with the PS of public service and, and we've been looking at the, the reforms. But I see still there is so much that needs to be cut out of all those standing orders to make it efficient. I like the recommendation of Eva of saying that we must put people on contract. When I come knowing that I have to deliver in three years and I am given a contract, I must be aware that at the end of these three years, I have to account for my time. And therefore I work a day and night and I strive to deliver certain results. Yeah. But if I know that finish, permanent, uh, permanent, I can even go and sleep and do what, and, you know, even if I report at two o'clock and I leave at three o'clock because that's what I see. People come, you know, at, at, at nine they report. Now they see this COVID. People just stroll in, you know, they were working from home, blah, 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 they stroll in. 11, they are going to have tea. Then at one o'clock, they are going to have lunch. Then someone has been reading newspapers Then blah, blah, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's, and you are like, really? Is this, is this what really we are here for? So yeah. I, 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 I like this discussion very, very much. I like this, this discussion. Actually, when Eva told me I was so excited, I said, my goodness, so people are really seeing that really we, we need serious thinking. And I really want yeah. to be part of this castle. I really want to be part of this castle so that we take them forward. We like writing policies and regulations. Everybody comes here and benchmarks, takes the things and implement. Our neighboring country, we are praising. Everything is good from here. All the policies in health are picked from here. Now for us, yeah. now we need to move a notch higher and we say, now let us implement the, the yeah. recommendations. Let us actually, let us now recommend, to recommend and recommend the implementation, implementation of all these things, all these reforms. Corruption, yes. if sure, if I cannot show my, my, my where I got this money, I'm, I should be put to test. 
I should be put to test. I should be investigated. I should, if yes. I am earning 15 million shillings, okay, and I, and I am able to buy a building of 5 billion, my goodness, why can't people really come after me? Why can't people come after me and, 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 and take this, this property? And they take this Indeed. property and then ask them, hmm, okay, we, we grab your property, then after that we investigate. We investigate. I, I know that the, the legal people may not uh, uh, agree with me on this one, but and, you are and innocent. We have two of them on the, on the session today. People know how to hide things. Yes, indeed. Uh, Dr. Dana, thank people you so much. Have, people know how to hide things. They hide riches in things. But, but, but we must. Yes, thank you so much. Let me stop here because I will not end. But thank you so much for this uh, webinar discussion. And uh, and for me, I am sold out to do this. Re I want to tell you I am sold out on this one. Thank you very, very thank much. Thank you very much, Dr. Diana. And I'm sure Eva will, uh, will, will let you know how we can collaborate even more. Uh, indeed, uh, things must really change in the way Uganda uh, works because we have no option but to move forward. And thank you for the comments about change of mindset, dealing with the legal bottlenecks, structure that has been overrun by time and digitalization, bureaucracy. All those indeed are very, very valid comments. We will have the next poll question before we have our chief guest today um, speak to us, and then we will up the public engagement where we will speak to the questions and opinions. And the question reads, would allowing public servants to work online or remotely improve efficiency? Would allowing public servants to work online or remotely improve efficiency? Yes, it would increase. No, they would not work well without close supervision. Uh, the third one is cost for internet might be a hindrance. And the last one is, I don't know. Do you think that allowing public servants to work online or remotely will improve efficiency? Yes, no, because uh, without close supervision, they won't work. The third one is cost of internet might be a hindrance. And the last one is, I don't know. Kindly make your view and your opinion known um about this very very important issue as you could see in the position paper of castle we advocate very very strongly that this is really the way to go but what do you think would allowing public servants to work online or remotely improve efficiency the view could be yes it will increase it no they don't work well without close physical supervision um three the cost for internet might be a hindrance. And the last one is, I don't know. We have about 20 seconds to go on this before we move into hearing from our chief guest today. Would allowing public servants to work online or remotely improve efficiency? Make your opinion known. We have about five seconds to close the poll. So please make your view known. Thank you very much for all of you that have participated. And there's a very, very close link between the yeses and the noes. Most people seem to think public servants don't work well without physical supervision. And that is a 43% view. The second bunch, which is 39%, thinks that indeed it will increase efficiency and then closely followed by two nine percent, one being cost for internet will be high, and the last one being, I don't know. So there's a very close between the yeses and the noes. So we will continue in the discussion today. And uh, indeed, we have a chief guest here today who is very, very competent to comment about the public service. And our special guest today is the Honorable Justice Ralph Ochan, who is the Chairman, Public Service Commission. He is also the current Chair of the Africa Center for Research and Legal Studies, which is a regional center for excellence devoted to the dissemination of legal knowledge and policy research. 
He is a member of the American Society of International Law, Canadian Council on International Law, African Association of Public Administration Management, Commonwealth Association of Public Administration and Management, African Association of Public Service Commissions, and the Uganda Law Society. The Honorable Justice Ralph has served as judge of the High Court, and that is in Masindi High Court Circuit between 2008 July to 2013. He served as secretary to the judiciary between 2005 to 2008. He was permanent secretary and served as minister in the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development between 2002 and 2005 and served as permanent secretary in Ministry of Foreign Affairs between 1998 and 2001, served as permanent secretary in Ministry of Tourism, Trade and Industry between 1996 and 1998, and served as director to mention but a few. Honorable Justice Rafa Chan has also served in several international engagements, which include member at the United National 28th, 38th and 57th National General Assembly's member of the OAU 1981-83 and 84 summits, member 1981-84 and 98 Commonwealth Heads of Government Summits in Melbourne, Australia, New Delhi and Durban, South Africa respectively, as well as a member of the delegation for the third UN Conference on Law of the Sea in 1974, 75 and 82 respectively to mention but a few. The Honorable Justice has also served on several boards, including but not limited to the National Agricultural Research Organization, Uganda Revenue Authority, Uganda Coffee Development Authority, Cotton Development Organization, Uganda Wildlife Authority, Gahinga and Penetrable Forest Trust, and Uganda Tourist Board. He holds a Master of Arts degree in Political Economy, a Master of Laws degree of the sea from both Dalhousie University, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. He also holds a Bachelor of Laws with honors from Makerere University. The Honorable Justice Ralph Ochan, we welcome you to speak to us today concerning the subject at hand. You're welcome, Justice. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, when I received the invitation to participate in this web-based workshop seminar, I told Dr. Magara that I was excited to be part of this process. I think that was an understatement. I'm sorry that I have not attended the previous web session in this um, by Castle Castle Think Tank. I look forward at the appropriate time when I step aside from the public assignment that I'm currently doing to be more actually being involved in the work that you're doing, to create a platform for thought in broad cross-cultural cross thinking to improve our society and public policies. Um, for the First of all, I like to say the paper, the summary of the work that was done by Castle Think Tank, by Mrs. Masiko, was very well presented. And I really congratulate the brain behind this and then the presentation by Mrs. Masiko itself. I can only promise that I will ensure that this paper is discussed at a, a bigger forum than this one. I will do my best to ensure that this paper is discussed at the annual workshop, the cabinet workshop. But before that, I will do my best to ensure that the permanent secretary themselves receive this presentation from Mrs. Matsiko at one of their monthly forum. I have the passion of Diana about the public service. And I've been there now coming to six years. I've been struggling to just in a small way ensure that some of these entrenched bureaucratic practices 
are done away with. And the first thing we succeeded in doing is to ensure that our recruitment process is now all online. This has dealt with a lot of the problems that you face on face-to-face -face interaction. First of all, I'll give you a small example. When we wanted to recruit 300 immigration officers, we got 30,000 applicants. And those days we still had not started the, the online recruitment system. So we, we had to devise means of reducing the number. One of the means was a 10 kilometer road run because immigration officers are actually security officers. Now that led us into a court case because some expectant mothers said we discriminated against them. We told them discrimination in favor of protecting the life for a mother and a child is non-discrimination in law. But that is the problem we are. But the greater problem is the problem of paperwork and face-to-face -face interaction. It is difficult. It is riddled with corruption. It is riddled with nepotism. It is riddled with all manner of malpractices. But now all applicants come online. The only time we have face-to-face -face interaction with the candidates are when they've finally been shortlisted and invited for interview. And even then, we still want to go a step further. There will be some proposals that will share with the public at the appropriate time. But now let me go back to the problem of ethics and integrity. The public service is 400,000 roughly, which is about 10% of the population. But 1% actually. The moral challenges that Diana talks about and that I experience every day is society-wide and the people we recruit in the public service come from that group of people who will appreciate me in my village because I misappropriate money and built a great big home. My neighbor who retires humbly because he's been working diligently in the public service is laughed at. Uh, and so the society itself is where we recruit our people from. And so uh, unless the problem of moral decadence, the complete collapse of the basic uprightness that is the foundation of any good society has collapsed. I mean, I see the struggle for political offices that's going on in the countryside. This, this all speak to the kind of group from which we must recruit public servants. And in the recruitment process, I can assure participants that the pressure we come under from not the people in the villages, but the ones who have put their children through universities and so on, is enormous. Even when the child doesn't qualify, I, I get people coming to say, look, this is my only son and you're my friend. I've been around too long, maybe I should. And you, you have to help me out. The, these are people who, what, what lesson would they, are they, would they have given to their children over the years? That because I'm a boss, don't worry, even if you get a past degree, I'll find a job for you. So, 
training the public servants, taking them through rigorous courses on integrity and so on. It's really a very small thing. The struggle to go back to uprightness is a countrywide problem. When I joined the service, I found people who, when the previous regime was removed, were able to come in and run a government. They were removed. A second group came in, a third group. I'm talking of this, the early 70s, I mean regimes. And those were men who lived humbly. They worked this hang the court around the, the on the back of the chair. It's a recent phenomenon. It wasn't there when I, for example, joined the service. There are some names whom you may. The great head of service, Henry Barlow, the great Frank Kalimudzo. These were men whom you looked up to. But now the young people have a challenge, I think, looking up to people. Most of the people who joined the service will first of all join because I don't think it's a question of is permanent. No, they will, they know that there are things which they call um, wet and dry ministries. The parents will come and want their son to go to Minister of Finance, Minister of Works, Minister of Energy. Minister of Water and Environment. They will never talk of humble places like the Director of Ethics and Integrity. Nobody wants to go there. The, the Minister of Public Service, nobody wants to go there. And this is a very universal statistic show the kind of pressure I come through to accommodate those requests. And they are not from your ordinary citizen. So, we must deal with this right from the leadership level. There must be, uh, even at the curriculum, the, the universities must teach ethics and integrity. They do that at Uganda Christian University. The children are taken through rigorous tests and challenges, questions on doing things right, being honest, being principal, living right, these are values that start not even in not even in school, at home. At home. So the problem is bigger than the Ministry of Public Service. The recruitment process, yes, we try our best to ensure that we do the best. And promotions are not are not routine. The permanent sec to become a permanent secretary, you do a uh, six hour written exam, and then you do what we call an um, basket test. You put topics in a basket, you pick it, and you address your peers, and they all judge you. And then we do an oral interview of a team of nine members of the commission, plus the head of public service for first entrance. It's rigorous. And I don't think long service is to be condemned. I don't think. I think that the rules and regulations need to be adjusted. I agree. I know the PPD Act, for example, was plunked on us from Washington. We never wrote the PPD. I was director of legal advisor services. I know this role was this role, this law was brought by some Italian consultant from the World Bank. Cut and paste. The law was originally drafted for Colombia, drafted for Colombia. The word Colombia was still there on the draft she came with. She, had, she was embarrassingly crossing it out, putting it back. So we, as the leaders, must ensure that the reforms we make, the, the laws we make, are relevant and contextual. The standing orders need to be updated. There's no question about that. The, the public service acts need to be. Even the, all the laws, but it must be done systematically, contextually, not emotionally. Rules are important, people. Rules are very, very important. You can't work. <laughs> it's in all of civilized society, there are rules and and regulation to govern the conduct of people. 
I think that I, I'm very excited by the proposals that are made here. I think ICT governance, e-government is long overdue. It's, it's, there is even a whole department, e-government in, in LITA and in the Ministry of ICT, but somehow the things are not moving and we must move. I think this COVID, <laughs> there is an, there's an upside to it. It has forced even those who would, who would have, who have desktops as the decoration to now begin to, to learn and to begin to work from a distance. It is a long haul because we started late, but we must move and, and, and move in that direction. In terms of human resource training, I think that we should up the capacity of the Public Service College in, in Jinja, it should, is, is, it's not an institution to be knocked, but to be fully supported. Right now, the institution only has management, um, teaching facilities, there's no resident. So it's difficult to use it effectively. And I'd like to see a day when the institution works along, alongside with um, Castle Think Tank, the first Ugandan think tank. Congratulations, Dr. Magara. This is a major, major step in the right direction. Without thought, there can be no um, proper policy coming out of decision making. And so I look forward to inviting Think Tank to come and work with us in government. This, this paper will be widely circulated with your permission and a forum will be organized for which you come. Um, Ms. Masiko comes and delivers and she has great experience. I congratulate her on the work she's been doing in all the various um, sectors that she's been involved in. That's the kind of, this is the kind of expertise we have right here at home. I don't need to go to Singapore to, to, to get somebody who can come and share with us. Um, I can't really go on. I think I've, I look forward to a, a much more open forum in which I can go point by point on some of the recommendation in view of my position. I can't really um, speak out now because I do this in a representative capacity, but we we'll look forward for to an occasion when we, an early occasion, I'll, I'll see to it. Um, there is something about local governments and, and central governments. The lady from the local government Association, the presenter did a good job in, in distilling the issues as we see it. Local governments, there is a peculiar problem in local governments. A, a philosophy has devolved, a practice has devolved among them that if you're not a son of the soil, you can't work, say, in my district of Amuru because you're not, we have our children. In one district, <laughs> it said, our son for the district engineer is inside here. When he finishes, we shall fill that post. In the meantime, we'll keep it open. We'll keep it closed. And so decentralization as a broad, I, I, we, we need to rethink it. And then of course, there's the pressure by the one inch to increase the number of districts. Everybody wants to have a district. That's that simply the resource envelope keeps dwindling and therefore the capacity to perform also goes down with it. 90% of the work is done there and therefore the government, the executive needs to think very seriously on how the 90% work being done at the district level can be funded. Spoke, speaking of the district service commission with whom we whom we supervise and we confirm the appointments, they work in awful difficult conditions. It is said the, the allowances and so on for the members is to be raised from locally generated revenue. To some districts that, that's an, an uphill task, they can't raise that kind of revenue. So I, I sympathize with the local versus center dynamics. I think that we need a, a debate. We need 
national debate on how to carry the great vision of decentralization forward. Um, I thank you, I've covered terrain. I look forward to a day when we shall do this in our own forum, in our own setting, with all the key stakeholders taking part in this. Once again, I thank um, Castle Think Tank. Thank you, Paul, for leading us in this conversation. I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, the Honorable Justice Rafa Chen, and a lot of things to think about and uh, creating hope for us and a good hope as a nation that we can still something about uh, the aspect that we are all concerned about. We have now gotten to that place where we're about to get into that public engagement. And uh, before I go in there, I will request that um, I read some of the comments that have been appearing on the Q&A as we get into that. There are some that are already answered. Samuel Siminyu, thank you for your comment. The Ugandan public service definitely has enlightened leadership at the top, but this is not where we see it at the service delivery points. Performance at service delivery points is dismal, to say the least. What goes wrong between the top and the bottom of the structure? That was something that uh, Samuel and Rose um, put something there. Reforms find space at central government level and do not effectively be tickled down to the local government level. And that's a point Rose very, very ably made earlier on. Olga Mugerua, greeting some of these issues we are raising, especially non-performance was pegged in the past with impunity because I know so and so and cannot be demoted or fired. This ushered in a culture of indifference as long as one still gets paid. It did not start today. So it will take an excavator to change this trend. Even some of our children believe this is the way to work. And then uh, Rose, uh, I'll put an, an addendum to that. Olga, this could be the mindset that Dr. Twina is advocating against. Who needs champions for change to start somewhere? And Olga agreed. Adam Akadama said, what is and where is the evidence for the private sector shift? into public service, such as contracts for core public service cadres. And that's something that has been discussed greatly on this, we'll continue to discuss. The chief administrative officers and town clerks at local government level sign performance contracts and undergo quarterly performance reviews. That's from Rose Gamera. Tennessee asks, what is the total number of employees in public service? and how many jobs are created annually in the public service. Eva responded, indeed, this was in her presentation as well. The 320,073 employees on the active government payroll, and uh, this includes staff in ministries, department agencies, health workers, local government employees, teaching service, Uganda police force, prisons, and public universities. And uh, Samuel Siminyu, asks at Gertrude, I believe you're talking to Rose, in our current national context, who is accountable to who in reality? From your presentation, it appears like the central government demands accountability from the local governments, leave citizens out of the picture. In a situation where our civic awareness and the legal processes constrain citizens' ability to demand accountability from government structures, get citizens to demand and receive accountability from the government structures at varying levels. And Rose responded that proactive mobilization of the citizens by partners in civil society who must build deliberate partnerships with the local government and central government institutions. Accord jointly implement with ULGA, the local government scorecard, which has a competent a competent of citizen, I think it says component of citizen engagement to assess the performance of local government leaders. And uh, she continues to make other comments. And Eva, somebody appreciated your presentation saying it was very good and passionate. And thank you very much. We still have a number of them 
that are open. I hope we still have. So maybe I will begin at that point and ask. There is one for you, Dr. Diana Atwini. And SGO OKH asks, Dr. Atwini, how practical do you think it would be to grab property of corrupt officials, as you recommended in your comments, when there is the element of, in inverted commas, connectedness? So Dr. Twine, if you could just quickly respond to that, and we have many other questions coming up. And I think the issue of connectedness, that is, that is the thing we need to deal with. That is, that is the thing that we need to deal with because if, if, we, if we advance connectedness, then we'll not be able to do anything. Um, I, I don't know whether I'm being hard. The network is bad. We need to deal with that we, issue we can of hear you. Where, the, 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 where, where there is evidence, then, then we need really to, to, to disentangle connectedness and, and really the will to, to fight corruption. That, that, that's it. That, that's, that's the message. Because we cannot marry the two. We cannot have connectedness and protectionism and 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 and, and then the discipline or, or, or sanctioning of, of the, the culprits. So I, I think the, the the two are to be separated. Thank you. Thank you so much. Am, am I am I hard? <laughs> I'm not hearing anything. Yes, we struggled a Can bit. Can someone hear me? We struggled a bit, but we could put together what you said. Perhaps uh, for the next comment, you just have the video switched off so you can only use your audio. The quality of uh, uh, transmission will definitely improve. Um, I'm okay. moving on to um, another related question, and I think I will throw this question to um, this question will go to Sharifa. So, Sharifa. Um, admin, help us mute the other microphones. Admin, please help us mute the other microphones. Sharifa, the, the question that is really closely related to this question that Dr. Patrini has hinted on, the, in Uganda, we do have the technical term, technical know who, it's society's term. And when you mention that in Uganda, everyone knows what that means. How do we deal with technical know who at entry level? Um, uh, in re I mean, compared to meritocracy. And I think um, the Honorable Justice has commented a few things, but I'd like to hear from you. Technical know who versus meritocracy. Just uh, comment on that because it's a big issue as well. Uh, thank you very much, moderator. Uh, just as uh, Justice Ralph Chan has commented, uh, at entry level into the public service, uh, he, he clearly mentioned that the people we employ come from the wider population of Uganda with different backgrounds, with different way of doing things, but in terms of what the public service is supposed to do in managing entry, the processes and procedures which are in place do not give uh, a, a smooth road for technical know who to shrive. But we have seen it happen, but just in a few, a few instances. And from the outcome of the, uh, of the results from the recruits, say from Public Service Commission, you cannot evidently say that people who come out of there uh, got those jobs because of technical know who. I'll give you uh, an example. For graduate entry level, somebody fresh from the university, it is very difficult for you to come to an oral interview without doing what we call written exams or aptitude tests. 
up to tests do not know relatives, do not know any other person, you know, it's your brain and you pass that on merit. That is why you see we can have a reduction from uh, 3,000 people to a ratio of one to six when we want to recruit 300 immigration officers. So the processes and what uh, Justice Ralph Ochan said that procedures rules have to be in place to govern what is done. So the procedures we have do not allow technical know-how to shrive. But if somebody that uh, has already entered the service, obviously your performance will be known. Your supervisors will make recommendations for you. Uh, what you have done will be visible. So when you go to the commission to defend what you have done, the people you are talking to have heard about it. I don't know why, whether that's what we are calling technical know-how, but results have to speak for you. We have seen many people go for interviews for commissioner, for assistant commissioner four or five times and never get it because what they do has spoken. So we know that from the society we come from, people come with different attitudes, come with different behavior and that impact on how they want to get what they want to get. The procedures we have don't allow it to shrive. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sharifa. The other question that I have that I will ask um, uh, Madame Rose Kamwera to speak to uh, something that Dr. Atwine hinted on, which indeed I had noted here before. Um, is that Uganda is very, very good at drafting policies and plans. And actually, it is said that if you want a good implementation plan, go to Uganda. Now, um, in your view, how can we as a country, what, what, what are your thoughts about converting this very good policy, uh, very good planning? How do we convert that to actual delivery, which we can benefit from in the country in order to change this um, not so very good narrative? Um, one of the biggest uh, challenges we have as a country still goes back to what we work with. National levels are supposed to make policies and laws. The local government must be empowered and capacity to translate the national policies and laws into local policies and pieces of legislation. You've heard of bylaws and all of things. But what has been happening since decentralization is that there's been very little investment in building the organ of local government council, which is the parliament at that level, to translate the national policies into local policies that guide implementation and execution of programs. And that gap, of course, creates an impact back to the national level policy successes. So we must invest again in strengthening the functionality of the local government institutions. And the legislative function is very, very key. Thank you very much, Rose. Um, um, I want to ask you, if you present the think piece and in this had very good reception. Is this acronym VUCA? Um, the world has become VUCA, volatile, uh, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. And uh, one of uh, the famous generals in the US Army, somebody called General Stanley McChrystal, wrote a book um, called Team of Teams, where he comments about the effect of complexity that even the US, with all its modern weapons and training of armies, almost got beaten hands down by terrorists in, in Iraq until they drastically had to change on the fly the methods of work that they were deploying in the theater. Now, one of the things that has been presented indeed even in your, in your, in your paper is the laws and uh, the Honorable Justice Ralph Ochan has hinted on it. I think also um, Dr. Diana touched on that we do have a lot of aging laws that are no longer relevant. As a legal practitioner, what is the realistic path in light of the discussion at hand to put this on track and get us uh, quickly to the place where 
we have laws that are functional and relevant to us towards improving the public service delivery. Thank you so much, um, um, Paul. I think one is review. Let's review what we want to prioritize. We can't change everything at all that, at the same time, but we can choose those laws that are game changers, that have a multiplier effect. And we can deal with those quickly and efficiently. When we want as a country, we can change laws quickly and it is possible. So we can do that. We can have a team that looks at the legal framework as it stands, and we, we look for the game changers and deal with those. Uh, and, and deal with those fast and quickly and expeditiously. One thing I want to put out there is that uh, it's a painful process. It's a painful process to restructure. And we have to be prepared as a country for that pain, <laughs> for the, uh, as the civil service for that pain. And sometimes it's the backlash against the pain that frustrates the laws. But if we do the, 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 the preparatory work, while on the side we are doing the legal reform, we can move forward, but we really can't debate much anymore that we need reform. We do need reform. Thank you, Eva. Do you, do you have any off the cuff, like one, two, three laws you can throw out there? N not in detail, but say mm -hmm. this and this needs to actually be urgently touched on. Okay, um, some we already mentioned in the paper about uh, like when, when you have to be physically present to contract uh, as a committee, for example, that restricted virtual, virtual, um, virtual, virtual contracting. And of course, there were some initially were safeguards, they were a safeguard against misconduct. But now we are seeing that there are safety measures that we can put in place that can help us move forward. So that's, a, that's an example of a law uh, that, that can be amended. I, I think we can also review you know, when something doesn't work, it doesn't work. Or if something doesn't produce the, 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 the fruit you want, that means you have to look at it again and see what needs to happen. So we've heard from uh, our, our commissioner from Public Service Commission, the various rigorous steps that are taking for recruitment. Okay, so if we are going through those steps, but we are still finding a problem, then it's a good place to look at it again and say, okay, what do we need to do differently? So even in the recruitments, um, other areas are, for example, uh, um, district service commissions. They are set up, they are very poorly funded, uh, who appoints them. So all these things affect then the human resource that is involved. So how can we look at the structure again? The good thing, there was a, a report, which I personally haven't read, but I think it's a good starting place that looked did a review of the structure and of course, these structures are embedded in the law in different legislation. We can use that as a starting point. What did that report recommend? Is it, are those good? Not everything recommended is a good recommendation. Are those good recommendations? How do we start on those ones and restructure? And while we do the, 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 the change management that will be needed, because it's going, as I said, it's going to be a painful process, but it is good for us. It's good for us as a country. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, in, a, in a little bit, we'll be taking on the third poll question. But before that comes up, uh, Dr. Twine, back to you. You have shared some pretty interesting experiences you've had in your work for national transformation. And one of the things that came out clearly was the challenges of corruption in the, in, in the public service. And indeed, the Honorable Justice Rafa Chan, in his comments, he highlighted this as a societal problem. It is not just a political problem, it is a societal problem. But in your fight against corruption where you have been posted um, severally, um, how does one root out corruption even within the current framework? Because there's people who are listening and following this discussion today and they want to know uh, what have been some of your practical things that you have done to make headway in this Summary of, of corruption that we are confronted with, you know, if you could share some practical things and then we'll move sure. into the, th the fourth poll question. Um, the, first, the first thing is the boldness and to do the odd 
because what what do you see right now the, 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 the our society tend to to favor uh, the, the the rich, the the prominence, the, the, the even in our uh, whatever, even re religious institutions. You know, when you come with money, if you give money to church, you you, you are the one who give even the front seat. So so the society has accepted that norm, but the first step is to be bold, to be bold and to, to swim against the currency. Now, what, what is now, what we want to see, how many people are ready to swim against the currency? Where the, the stream is flowing northward and for you, or you get a, just a people who will swim south and to do the odd in, in the interest of reversing what, what is taking place. Now, that one, First, you, 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 of course, it, it is a conviction. You, you have to first be convicted in your heart and, 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 and what you believe in that really you have the, you, you, you will take a step. Even if, let me tell you, you, you can't succeed. Because you, you see, Effort. It must be an institution and a thing of everyone. Now, of course, sometimes at the, at, at, at the, you get all these obstacles, you get branded, you get, you get, you, 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 you get backlash on you because some people definitely, you require a lot of energy to do the, the odd, you really, and to be consistent because when you start now and, and then everything is, is not, you, you, you are not able to, to move a thing. And then, then you, you say, hands down, I am, I am defeated. Then that's not the way. If we are going to, to fight corruption, first and foremost, we must be convicted in our heart and, and move out of, of that comfort zone. And, and we do the odd. For me, uh, that example I was giving you of, of the procurement, someone comes up with it and I have canceled. I have canceled. I said, no. I will not sign this contract. I will not sign. I have to go back and then they tell you now, now the, the procedures, now, now people are going to take you to court in the court. So let, let wh whoever wants to go for administrative review goes and then you, then you keep on, you have someone now to come and explain yourself why you canceled this. Why did this why? Then they take you to all sorts of, you know, you receive all sorts of, and, and, and then you have to be, you, 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 you don't have to be, you, you know, the, 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 the favorite of, of, the, of the many. No, because when you do those things, pinge on other people's comfort. But, but the issue is that when we talk about corruption fight, we must be convicted in our heart that there is, there must be an effort. You wake up in the morning, you go to work, knowing that today I will not be compromised. Today I will not do something that will put my, my country to, to disrepute. I will not, you know, something like that. It has to start inside in your heart, in, in your conviction. Then, you start implementing, but consistently. Because when you are consistent, first it requires a lot of energy. You, you, as I told you, swimming against the currency, you, you have to use the extra energy to, to, to swim against the currents. Then all the other thing is that we, we need to have this, 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 this castle discussion is one of those. It has to go beyond a discussion. Then it becomes an implementation forum. Something, if I, if, if I have uh, Justice Rafa Chan, is there? I said this person is of integrity. I have, I have, I, I have, I have searched. I have vetted. This person is is hardworking. Please, when there is opportunity to give such a person, please give him a job. We want 
create a network of people who think alike, who act alike, and who, who see things in the same way. Now, it worked. That networked with one vision, with one goal. People are ready to bring a hope or, or, or whatever, whatever you can use, whatever tool you can use, then we break slowly. And daily, the strength of, of the water eroding, the strength lies in consistently passing over that stone and then eventually it erodes. That, that, that in corruption, we lie largely on consistently moving one step towards finishing this mountain. Right. Thank you so much. We uh, cannot say even we shall finish the, the mountain because I, I can assure you it is, it is, it is, it is a difficult thing. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Diana. We are getting your link breaking up quite a bit there. Uh, but I think the crux of your point has been made. We have to decide within ourselves that we will do it. And it's a daily process every day you wake up. And as well, the consistency of repeating yourself over and over again until uh, one achieves uh, victory of uh, this fight against corruption. So at this point in time, I'm going to ask the administrators to put up the fourth and last poll for today before we get back into the Q&A and then other questions. The last question for today is, um, administrators, please help us with the microphones. Uh, the last question is, in your opinion, is the public sector critical to the development of the nation? In your opinion, is the public service, I believe they meant public service, critical to the development of the nation? The answers are yes, government cannot operate effectively without a public service. No, we can achieve as much or even better using NGOs and civil society. Three, we would do better if the public service worked complementarily with the private sector. In your opinion, is the public service critical? to the development of the nation. Please make your view known and uh, it will help us as we create traction. In the words of Dr. Diana, the water erodes the rock by going over it consistently over time. This is what we are trying to do as Castle. So in your opinion, is the public service critical to the development of the nation? Yes, government cannot operate without it, no. We can achieve as much or even better using NGOs and civil society. Three, we could do better if there is collaboration between public service and public and private sector. In the next 20 seconds, we will be closing the poll. So the opinion is valuable. Let us know so that we can inform the decisions and engagements forward. In your opinion, is the public service critical? To the development of the nation. In the next five seconds, we'll be closing the poll. Thank you very much for everyone that polled. The interesting result is that no one believes you can do without it. And 52% uh, believe that collaboration as an approach between the public service and the private sector is critical. And a close 48% says that government will not operate effectively without this public service. Thank you very much for polling with us. I will go back to the Q&A and pick up a few comments and questions. Uh, Gabriel Iguma says, these issues have been documented. Why don't we see them implemented? And I think that's part of the discussion that's ongoing. Right now, Elijah Chisembo, Rose, you are spot on on what we need. And what we need is to rethink the concept of business models. What is government's business model? If 96% of staff are in local government, but no resources 
are assigned in the sense of only 9% of the budget being given toward the 96%. And uh, indeed, Elijah added, Madam Sharifa, thank you for your leadership and the great work that you are doing. Joseph Jakisa Award says, Dr. Twine, thank you for expressing your experiences. Shame upon those who collude with the lawyers to milk our nation for their selfish interests. Samuel Siminu says, at Sharifa, thank you for the passionate contribution to the discussion. Talking about automation is the way to go in public service provision. I have personally found some of the efforts cosmetic and unfruitful. Take the URA online services, for instance, they are almost impossible to work with, even for a person at level of exposure. They seem to be wired to fail the client slash citizen so that they are forced to hire agents who work as intermediaries at a cost. The same could be said of passport applications under the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Is there a mechanism in place to ensure that these online systems are universally accessible, usable, and not merely cosmetic cover-ups? And then Jackie Opondo, thank you panelists for the presentations and submissions on this matter. We appreciate the efforts being made in the areas of capacity development, devolution, decentralization, and processes and systems and other factors. One of the main factors that has impeded development and performance of the public sector is corruption. <clears throat> A number of challenges highlighted by failure to achieve the objectives of NDP1 and NDP2 can be traced to systematic or systemic corruption in the public sector. How is this being addressed? And at that point of Jackie Opondo, I will revert back to some of the questions that we had prepared. Indeed, the question of systemic corruption, Jackie, is something that we have to continue addressing as a nation. We had the submissions by the Honorable Justice Ralph Chan. We had the submissions by uh, Dr. Diana Atwine. What is interesting is um, when um, Sharifa was beginning her comments, she highlighted that we had focused a lot as castle on NDP3. Yes, indeed. And there is cause for that because NDP1, from our experience of the last 19 webinars, there are many instances where we keep dropping out on things we should have achieved in NDP1, in NDP2. So we need to stop the trend as well of failures of these NDPs or losing out on critical points. And Sharifa, I'm coming to you now um, on performance management. We highlighted the examples of Botswana and Rwanda as African examples. Of course, Singapore is a global example that we all know about, where in the early 60s, they made a drastic change that the entire world thought was out of this world uh, in terms of how their public service was going to work. Now, the, the real question is, how do you get performance management practically running? You know, it comes from selection, uh, slash meritocracy, that one you have commented about it, but then there is also the issue of um, performance management itself. Performance management happens in cycles. You agree on deliverables or quality objectives. There is consistent feedback coming in and that feedback can be applied at review points. There is performance improvement plans as a way to caution a member uh, about um, oncoming exit if there is no improvement. There is the actual performance discussions. Practically, where is that working within the public service? How can we get it to be working across the board in the public service? Because it is, even within the private sector, an animal that requires consistent commitment and total support all the way at the for it to work. Sharifa. Comment on that, please. Uh, thank you, moderator. Performance management. Uh, in the public service, it is similar to what you have described. Uh, we have to ensure clarity of job roles and job requirements to the person we are engaging. Uh, we set performance, we come up with performance plans at the beginning of the implementation period. 
we are required to undertake performance reviews on a quarterly basis. And currently we are reviewing that because for people who need to work remotely, you cannot afford to wait for a quarter. We might have to start uh, putting in place weekly milestones to be accomplished. Then uh, cumulatively on a quarterly basis, we record the performance results, which are used at uh, the end of the performance period to give the performance rating. That is documented. However, the issue of compliance has been a challenge to the public service. And starting uh, last financial year, uh, government took it upon itself to ensure that my, uh, performance management becomes an auditable area. And I would like to report gladly that we have uh, really had gains in this and the level, the percentage level of managing performance has improved from 53, last year we recorded 85. But our standard and our desired end is 100%. So making it an auditable, inspectable area has improved uh, management of performance and reporting on performance. That's where we are now. But as uh, we discussed uh, the interventions under the NDP, we want to up the game and go into performance contracting. Uh, we are still debating the issue of employment on contract because you have all alluded to the fact that the remuneration is still low, but that is not a reason for anyone not to perform. Because if you feel the salary being paid to you is low, it's better you quit the job and do what you think can pay you more. So at the moment, we are into performance contracting, uh, head teachers of primary schools, sub-county chiefs, chief administrative officers, heads of departments, and officers up to principal level are all on performance agreements. What was lacking was ensuring compliance, and we have made it an auditable area. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sharifa. And indeed, I keep getting hope uh, when I listen to the discussions here that we are getting there. One of the things that has come up on this discussion, and I, I want to address this, I would like to hear the comment of both Eva and Rose on the next uh, question. Dr. Atwine in her comments mentioned the urgent need for computerization uh, and automation of workflows, um, getting into the fourth industrial revolution that she believes would improve her delivery in her area of the health services sector. Now, the issue of computerization as well, when you look at it closely, the jealous justice and law order sector, there's a lot of ineffectiveness and inefficiency in that area that could simply be solved by proper and appropriate um, uh, automation of workflows, which comes with digitization and computerization, and um, the area of finance and approvals, uh, the area of sharing of information. How can we make this work in the Ugandan public service? Because one of the elements that has come out as well strongly in this discussion is the need for us to move into the digital age or the fourth industrial revolution. So let's have um, both rows. Uh, to comment on that, and then Eva. Maybe I, I will take the first shot, probably then. Hello? And hear you clearly, Rose. Please go ahead. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, of course, uh, uh, I was thinking through what Dr. Diana had, had mentioned, but one of the things uh, I've been grappling with right now was hearing from Sharifa is the need to have uh, the. Uh, let me go. Let me say like this: when it comes to digitalization and the public service. The definite uh, uh, thing that must be done is to have this take place because it creates a symbiotic relationship between the people and the system. 
And this takes me to what I was uh, just grappling with when Sarita was talking about performance assessment and improvement. Evidently, what we have happening today is that you get a certain uh, sector uh, handling institutional performance assessment. Then you have institutions themselves, the public service, handling individual performance assessment. And then the, 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 the systems are not, the results are not speaking to each other. Then you have another one handling the, the we have the scorecard. It doesn't feed into the technical. So the, that is one gap that needs also to be addressed. The systems must speak to, to each other. Yes, you are addressing the, the, the assessment of performance of the public service. But the institutional structure system, I think giving them the right environment to be able to deliver, that this seems to be a, a disconnect in, in the results speaking together that we can get the appropriate solution. So I believe that when we go to the digital realm, this can be resolved. Because in that way, you're trying to match the system, the system efficiencies with the users, the people, and probably we, we definitely can, can clearly see some change in terms of progress. Thank you so much, uh, Rose and uh, Eva. Um, um, I think we have lessons we can learn. They are, they are public service entities that have made inroads in this, this area, and there are lessons to learn there. And those, those entities have, um, have uh, systems that they're using that can be applied to other entities. I think we should avoid reinventing the wheel if we can, because it's cheaper not to do so. Secondly, um, as you know, there are also interests in systems. There are interests for the providers to sell us their systems so that we buy licenses every year. And so there are also interests in different entities having different um, systems. So that's an area. We, we have uh, Nita Yu, for example, who should be helping us and leading us in this space as a, as, as a country on how, what are the most appropriate systems and how we, we don't have one in, in, in Ministry of Gender that is different from the one in the Ministry of Energy that is different. So how do we have systems that speak to each other? I understand there was a, a, a review done. I don't know how far they've gone in terms of implementation. But uh, uh, making sure that where there are successes, let's learn from them. Let's do what is good for us. There is no reason why we should, um, we should build other people's businesses. Let's do what's good for us as a country. What is effective for us, what is cheap enough for us to use, and we shall be fine. The other area in terms of digitalization, we, we've tried Zoom calls with the people seated in Kabong, and they have worked to an extent. The issues of connectivity, and we really need to strengthen uh, our 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 framework, our network, so that we we can get this. Uh, I don't know what you call them, the backbone. Is that the, the technical term that yes, can help us build on? Yes, that we can build on. If this this uh, underlying structure is not in place, it's harder to build on. So can can those who are charged with those uh, fundamental structures get them up and running sufficient? so that government can run. I think those are my, and lastly, of course, the people that use us, a system can fail no matter how good it is, if the users are either not supported to use it or unwilling to use it. But we, we also, as all this thing is going to require change management so that people can, can be helped to be successful in their new mode of working. Thank you very much, Eva. I want to bring this to a close by reading a few last comments that people made here. And Jackie Opondo writes and says, talking of bureaucracy, and she quotes, the more numerous the laws, the more corrupt the state. This is by Ta Takitas. And uh, Olga Mugera, the central issue is a resolved by the leadership to address these problems in public service. Technical know who is a vice, and there is need to address steps to get people to work on merit. And SGO OKH uh, say special thanks to the Honorable Justice Ralph Chan. Thanks for being a salt and light to the world. You are inspirational, and that is a very good point for me to begin bringing this to a close. We want to appreciate beginning with our 
special guest, the Honorable Justice Rafa Chan, who has had to exit the call to go and attend to other places. But we do appreciate the fact that he gave us his time and his presence up to this point in time. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharif Abuzeki, for giving us your time. Thank you so much, Madam Rose Gamera. Thank you so much, Dr. Diana Atwini. And uh, my name is Bukenya Paul Michael. And before I hand over to Dr. James Magara, I just want to thank each and every one of you for the time and for the contributions that you have made today. Dr. James Magara for the closing remarks and comments, as well as the closing prayer for today. Dr. Magara. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for guiding us through this discussion. And uh, also very, very special thanks to um, the panelists who gave um, very candid um, presentations about this very big elephant in our room called Uganda. And uh, special thanks to our special guests as well. Uh, thank you for being with us and also the offers you've made, which we'll follow you up on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, participants, for staying the time. Uh, it's been a consistent presence throughout. Um, as a think tank, one of the roles you play is uh, creating a platform for these kinds of discussions. Because um, I've learned a lot today. I'm pretty sure everyone here has learned a thing or two. But uh, also, you begin to hear things from many different sides. Um, and uh, that always helps. You, you may not know it, but it begins to influence decision-making, policy-making, and so on. The more we hear from different uh, people, uh, the better are informed, a better informed our decisions that we make. So it is our hope that this presentation has contributed something. Uh, we still have a follow-up, as I said at the beginning to put this into different policies. I think I'd like to underscore what uh, Dr. Diana said, that uh, policies and uh, trainings have a certain level. Um, we are killing our country slowly by not really being uh, tight on doing things right. I mean, it's very good to talk and say things. So I do hope that we'll come to a place where we'll begin implementing. Uh, and really see a change. But we're very appreciative hearing what government is doing. Thank you, Madam Sharifa, for enlightening us about what is ongoing. And it's our hope that uh, uh, as these things get implemented further, we'll see our country change. Uh, the, the public service is so critical to the running of the country. It's like uh, the little engine in there, the heartbeat. If it's not working properly, nothing else will work. So thank you all. I will need to bring this to a close and I'll lead in a word of prayer as we close. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the men and women who are working to ensure that our public services work, both at the central and local level. It came out clearly today that there are, there are good things happening, but there are also many things that are out of sync, out of place. And we pray, Lord, that as we move into this decade, especially, that the painful decisions that have been made will be made and we will have an efficient public service that will be a foundation for the private sector to thrive as well. We thank you, we ask you to bless this weekend and uh, bless all those who have been part of this uh, webinar, whether as panelists or as participants. We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. thank you very much. Paul, um, I know they're talking about next week. Oh, please uh, go ahead, Dr. Magra, and make that comment. Yes. Uh, next week, we are having a very, very um, interesting uh, panel that you should not miss. It's on the justice, law, and order sector. Uh, we have very, very interesting panelists. And uh, so please plan to be there. Book the time. We are running up to, I think it's the 19th of December, uh, to finish up all this Thrive series. They're ending this year. Every weekend, there is a different one. And uh, out of this, a uh, lot of other documents are coming out. So thank you for your participation. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you all. Have a good weekend. Bye. All right. God bless you all. Bye.